Now you had to wait a little for the second video. I'm sorry about that. But today I have the full rant. So if you watched the first video, then you now already know what peer review is about. If you're a scientist, you know any case. And just in case you need a short reminder why I'm actually producing this video, this was the occasion. This is a good paper, except yeah, this paper is kind of okay. Weak except. This paper is not so great, but maybe after changes, weak reject. This paper is broken beyond all reason. REJECT! So let's talk a bit about the pitfalls in peer review. The pressure to publish in peer-reviewed venues may be very strong. Therefore, authors that experienced previous rejections might be looking for lower-ranked venues in order to have their work accepted quickly. While this option seems like a quick way out, this path may also lead to trouble. Predatory journals advertise fast publication with full peer review. Often this is even done with a reference to a prior publication of the authors in a spam mail. Unfortunately, they simply publish any contribution without peer review and charge a publication or conference fee. Acceptance of the paper in such a journal may result in serious damage to the author's reputation. Even if the submitting author did not know the nature of this journal or is just a co-author that has been added to the author's list without his or her knowledge. Public lists of such journals help to avoid such fake peer reviews. What works for journals can obviously also be adopted to conferences. Predatory conferences are also difficult to spot. Often they are at popular tourist locations such that submissions and travel become even more attractive. One way to identify such conferences is to look for similar events occurring at the same date and location. You might be able to find several world conference on insert topic here that are organized simultaneously, sharing even the same keynote speakers. In order to avoid such scam events, you want to consult your colleagues or conference rankings like Guide to Research. Lately, also video journals have emerged. While the peer review process seems rigorous, the publication and the production of the video by the journal may be rather expensive. Therefore, authors are well advised to study potential cost of publication before submitting to anyone. There is also something that could be regarded as toxic behavior in peer review. Plain misconduct is generally very rare. However, toxic behavior is found much more often. The example that I'll report here range from unpleasant but common to extreme cases. Note that it took my entire career to collect these examples. Scientific fraud is extremely rare, yet one cannot deny its existence. A very common toxic behavior is to be overly negative to other works. Even during anonymous peer review, you will not be represented to work of your own institution. As many conferences set a hard threshold on the acceptance score, any negative review that you will create will increase the probability of your own group's papers to be accepted. Also, you may spot similar work to your own and you may want to delay its publication on purpose. Hence, a common strategy of some reviewers is to find easy reasons to reject a paper. Statements like not novel, not clear enough and other only coarsely grounded reasons are typically found in such rejects. Therefore, you want to make sure that you are aware of all relevant literature and compare it to your own work in the best case to counter any claims of lacking novelty. Also, highlight the strong points of your method or research as much as possible such that claims of lacking clarity can be avoided. If you work in machine learning, you also want to avoid 
the seven sins of machine learning as their easy indications for fast rejection. Also, some reviewers try to increase their own citation statistics. You will spot such reviews giving a mixed review in combination with the demand to cite several papers that are all written by the same group of authors. While using such behavior to increase one's own citation count is already questionable, this procedure is problematic for another reason. The identity of the reviewer is easy to guess and may therefore hamper the anonymity of the peer review process. Hence, performing such reviews is not very advisable. With the increasing number of submissions in the past years, the number of peer reviews is also increasing. Therefore, some reviewers who run out of time don't do the assessment themselves. If they happen to be the head of a group, they sometimes ask a member of the team to perform the review for them. If they still check the review for the validity and even if the assisting person agrees to help in a confidential matter, this process is still prone to error as the confidential peer review material has to be transferred to a third party. Hence, the procedure is legally questionable, in particular at venues that do not have clear legal terms. Fortunately, this trend was already identified several years ago and countermeasures, such as enabling peer review also for junior researchers, has been enabled. This increases the number of possible reviewers and decreases the workload for every reviewer. Editors and meta-reviewers have a lot of power. With great power comes, who would have guessed, great responsibility. It is tempting to push a decision towards a certain direction because you know it is right, you are the person in charge, and there is no way how your decision could ever be changed. It will just save the authors, the reviewers, and yourself a lot of time, right? Well, no. You might be missing an argument or an important observation that could tip the decision. Therefore, ending a controversial review on a paper prematurely comes at the risk of a wrong decision, in particular if you have to overturn the majority of the reviewers, as in the example that we had in the beginning. REJECT! Imagine how you would feel as an author not being able to respond to a controversial critique, a final, questionable practice happens when meta-reviewers and editors assign papers only to their own students. This enables the forming of cliques and increases the likelihood of receiving similar dependent reviews. Therefore, the reviewers for a certain paper should ideally originate from different institutions worldwide. Obviously, there are also clear instances of misconduct. Cases of scientific misconduct are rare and have severe consequences if people are caught. In particular, plagiarism of other words are easy to spot and will be discovered sooner or later. Since the emergence of plagiarism checkers, this process can be performed automatically and many journals and conferences already use them or plan to employ them in the near future. Therefore, copy and paste from other works is not advised. In order to drive their own citation count, some authors engage in so-called paper mills. Typically journals of low rank or even predatory journals are used for these purposes. Also some authors form cliques that engage in heavy mutual citation. While some of such networks may simply emerge from the structure of a certain field, clearly abusive instances are also known. A recent discovery of a paper mill found more than 400 papers plagiarized, including copied figures. Every now and then, falsified results appear in research. Severe cases make even headlines in general news. Making a significant discovery is of course tempting, yet the period of fame will be only very short, therefore it lies in the interest of all scientists to be very careful about one's own observations. The will to scientific discovery may be strong, yet the consequences of fabrication or even carelessness will be discovered as soon as the experiments cannot be reproduced by others. In particular in machine learning research, this might easily emerge by simply not paying enough attention. Such tampered results are likely not to be discovered by the peer review process and therefore are a significant threat to any researcher. And there's also things under the tip of the iceberg. The previous cases are 
probably well known to all centers. Yet I also encountered other instances of misconduct that might not be as well known. The cases reported in the following happened and have been reported. Hence, I advise anybody to refrain from such practices. Yet, you may find some of these incidents shocking. Please note that I have been active in many different scientific communities and therefore you will not be able to guess in which community the respective incident happened. And I also advise against even attempting so. I will also not answer questions on who was actually involved in these incidents. Peer review is of a stochastic nature. We know from probability theory, the more often we try, the higher the odds will be to have a paper finally published. Yet this procedure takes some time because concurrent submission of papers is not allowed. Still I have seen attempts of groups that understand the nature of the peer review process very well. In a particular case, the office changed the title, the abstract and the keywords and submitted the exact same paper twice. On this particular conference, the reviewer selection was based on keywords. Therefore, the probability of getting the same reviewer twice is with a disjoint set of keywords very small. With two submissions, you will double the chance of having your paper accepted. In the case that both submissions get accepted, you simply withdraw one. In this particular case, however, the program chairs looked at all the papers sharing the same set of authors such that the attempted fraud was detected. The matter was escalated up to the board of the specific community and was dealt with according to the community stamp. Sometimes a paper seems to be somewhat familiar and by accident you may even end up reviewing your own paper or a paper from your group. Obviously such incidents have to be reported to the program chairs and they will take care of this issue. Also, authors sometimes change after the acceptance of the paper. More often than not, papers get finished in the last few hours or minutes of the submission deadline. Therefore, there must be opportunities to correct for last minute mistakes. However, what should never occur is that a reviewer suddenly appears as a co-author of a submission after the acceptance of the paper. Obviously, this incident was also reported and dealt with by the community standards. The most shocking incident that I ever encountered in peer review, however, is a result of a combination of several of the above mentioned practices. A really unfortunate series of events. In this case, a young researcher submitted a paper to a highly esteemed double bind conference in the field. The paper was rejected by a close margin. Several of the comments helped to improve the paper. Six months later, the paper was submitted again to a well reputed single blinded conference. This time, however, the paper was immediately rejected. REJECT! Due to plagiarism. The new reviewers considered the paper as plagiarized and reported this finding to the conference chairs who started an investigation against the submitting author. After careful consideration, the investigation found out that the anonymous double-blinded version that was first submitted to the other conference was discovered on a public file server of a, another very well-known group in the field. Apparently, the paper was uploaded to the file server by one of the anonymous peer reviewers of the first conference. It seemed that a senior researcher delegated the review to one of his subordinates. What did not occur to him was that the group's file server was not protected against search engines. Therefore, Google started indexing the content of the file server. And as a result, the second conference reviewer found the paper when he was looking for relevant literature in the state of the art. He identified the paper as a plagiarism as the authors were different than the owners of the server. After the investigation concluded, the submitting author was found not guilty of plagiarism. Furthermore, this complicated chain of events did not lead to any measures against the group that uploaded the anonymous paper to their own public file server. In the end, the submitting author left academia and never graduated from their PhD. So how can you counter such problems? If you spot significant toxic behavior, you can report it. Conferences and journals offer confidential comments to the deciding instance. If you suspect a reviewer to have crossed the line, report your suspicion to the associate editor or a meta review. 
In any case, you should grant the benefit of the doubt, as the recommendation to cite only papers from a certain group may simply be related to factual grounds. Always scrutinize your own suspicions. Use archive. Once you publish your ideas in your and your co-author's names, ideas cannot get lost in anonymous peer review anymore. This is an excellent way to protect your intellectual property. Publishing preprints on archive is now accepted by all major machine learning and pattern recognition conferences. Obviously, you want to make sure that all your co-authors agree with this and potential inventional disclosures are already submitted. Also make sure that you update the archive submission with the reference to the final publication such that other researchers find the peer-reviewed published paper. Note that archive is not a scientifically peer-reviewed source. If the paper is only on archive, it's probably preliminary work. It may still contain potential errors and may be updated in its final publication. Also don't report archive publications as a relevant prior art as reviewer, in particular if the paper appeared there after the submission data. Not all countermeasures have to be taken by yourself. Conferences and journals now heavily rely on plagiarism checks. In many conferences and journals, reviewers now get the paper and the plagiarism report for the assessment of the work. Also meta-reviewers and reviewer assignments are typically manually checked by the program committee. Often reviewers and metas get assigned confidential scores that rate their trustfulness. All misconduct is handled in sequence. We do that in order not to damage science as a whole. Scientists should generally perceive as knowledgeable and trustworthy. Remember, misconduct is very rare, mistakes are more frequent. Always grant the benefit of the doubt. Unfortunately, there is no clear and unique code of contact that would clarify what misconduct is associated to what kind of punishment. Cases are dealt with on an individual basis. Therefore, consequences can also vary considerably from community to community, from country to country. Be aware of the rules that apply to you. Follow them and engage against toxic behavior and peer review. For example, by increasing your colleagues' awareness to the topic. Don't commit acts of vigilant justice and accusations on social media. If you spot misconduct, every scientific institution has an arbitration body that will take care of the issue appropriately. In some communities, the public accusation of misconduct may be considered as misconduct itself, as it damages the reputation of science as a whole and is in violation of granting the benefit of the doubt. Remember, peer review processes are complex, stakes are high, and certain behavior is very easily misinterpreted. Always suspect that everybody is acting on their best intentions, but be prepared for the worst case. And as a last hint, don't travel to the conference that rejected your work and distribute the paper on your own. If you have ever encountered a person doing this in front of a conference venue, you will immediately realize well, this is not very advisable. So let's have a look at some take-home messages. Watching this video, it probably became clear that peer review has many problems. Yet we are not aware of any system that works better. Also, we have seen that there is no single version of peer review. Every scientific community is building their own standards at their own needs. In addition, many peer review systems undergo constant change in order to find better solutions. This also prevents exploitation by the players in the field who simply know the process very well. If you are in charge of adjusting a peer review process, make sure that none of the involved persons ends up with too much power. Generally, all contributors aim at acting on a fair and reasonable basis. Yet, abuse of power may be tempting and may be hard to spot. Archive is probably one of the best countermeasures against unfair peer review and it takes the pressure of the need of early publication. Yet archive submissions cannot be regarded as a full scientific piece as they have not undergone scientific peer review successfully. Toxic behavior in peer review generally only reduces the quality of the result of the peer review process. It aims to get an unfair advantage over other groups. Furthermore, toxic reviews 
are likely to invoke more toxicity. Therefore, one must refrain from using toxic practices at all times, even if you were a victim of such behavior yourself. Some behavior may seem as misconduct, but it may be also just an unfortunate series of events. Therefore, always grant the benefit of the doubt. If you suspect misconduct, contact your arbitration body. Do not go public immediately, as it may very well harm your own career. So always treat others as you want to be treated yourself.